everyone. Welcome to Gov Geeks Assemble. Level up your nine to five on 95. I'm Javier. And I'm Karen. And together we are the Gov Geeks, which is great. But this is a special edition of the Gov Geeks here. So, Shai, thank you so much for joining us. We're here at Awesome uh, Con. And yeah, and you know, I think this is the where we met a couple this of years is ago. Where right? our friendship began mm -hmm. on our families were respectively online for the Weird Al Yankovic photo op exactly and i you all had the greatest spider-verse family <laughs> spider-verse cosplay it was awesome i still remember it to this day and i thought you all were so cool and then i, I forget how like the social media mentions went from there but from there once i i knew more about the gov geeks i knew we had to be friends so. of course and, and we've built that partnership ever since which is super cool so yeah i mean and so awesome con brings people together it, it does, does doesn't it <laughs> I, I mean, individuals, uh, organizations, communities, it's just, uh, it's a nice thing. <laughs> but so this year's the first time that we've actually had a booth here at AwesomeCon. And it's amazing. Now, it's, it's super fun. We, we had the idea from you. We had a chance to go see you at another con mm -hmm. and you had your booth set up and everything. And Karen and I were like, oh my God, that was so incredible. Yep. So when we had the chance to, to be on your, your podcast. Oh yeah, yeah. Wow. I was, you know, the pre-pandemic times, but I love what you did here because you're wonderful people and you are offering such an incredible thing with gov geeks and then you level up you always use that term level up you have this whole other level where people are getting to experience who doesn't like i've given a million tours of federal agencies that i worked in and no matter what happens the picture at the podium is always the biggest hit and the fact that you're giving people <laughs> that experience here at a comic con i think it's it's giving like public service a spot in this world of fandom yes. that where it belongs. It's really awesome. And, and we're nestled in between NASA, the Marines, loud and public library, yeah, CIA, CIA, Coast Guard. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like a perfect spot. But I don't know, it just came it came to fruition, right? We were just thinking through we've been coming to the cons for years. Mm -hmm. And with this, you know, creation of the Gut Beats, it just seemed like a national, you know, natural progression to have something like this. So it's oh, been really exciting. Wow, we're watching. There's some Marines doing some pull-ups over there. It's really I, cool. I, I love top gun style. When, yeah. Exactly. When you see how many of these agencies are re actually represented in films and movies, I think it's brilliant that they're here telling people what it's you know really about but also embracing the fun of the fiction part and not being too serious it's, yeah. it's which, really which terrific only in dc we had we had somebody come by who was like this is great like i've never been to a comic con where you have like agencies and like this type of you know public service presence i was like well yep you're in yeah. the dc you're in the beltway you're in you know the Toby fever before we forget so yeah speaking about podcasts and really celebrating excited. and everything yeah. we do get excited that's kind of what we do yeah. uh so the friday night movie podcast as well uh i know that that's a, a great great show the, we've had the, a chance to, to you know spend a little bit of time there as well and similar to you all family is in a lot of way where it started friday night movie every week for over four years, myself and my sisters get together and we talk about movies and pop culture and television and family. It's the language of our family in a lot of ways because we've watched as many movies as we watch for this podcast. We've been watching our whole life mm. and we've it's been such a huge part of our life. Like my sisters both ha had didn't have children when we started the show and then their kid or they had maybe one between the two of them and now they have four between the two of them and their respect you know and like they, they, in fact my sister becky we were telling the story how one day she found out in the morning that she was going to have to go deliver later that night oh wow so we recorded an episode she went to the hospital had the baby on my birthday by the way oh wow very cool birthday present. <laughs> and then the next week was thoughtful was back was back on Zoom to record our next episode. Wow. Oh, yeah. That, that's dedication. dedication. Ready to roll. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of dedication, so you've been a public servant for many years now as well. Uh, and I know you were mentioning another one in terms of uh, growth opportunities and what you're doing with the Center for uh, a New American Security as well. That, that, yeah, that's right. So I spent um, 12 years at the State Department. And uh, when I left in, in the end of 2017, or yeah, the, the fall of 2017, I um, embarked into the nonprofit world of policy making or policy research and national security and foreign policy. And I've been working at various um, nonprofit institutions. And for the last few years, I've been working at the Center for New American Security, which is a bipartisan national security research institution. And it's, it's an amazing place with some of the most creative minds 
in policy and uh, with a real emphasis on bold ideas and idea and pragmatic fact-based research. It's not really about, um, it's not about pushing a particular ideological agenda. It's really about what are the policies that we think are, are actually practical that we can get through to make the country safer, improve, you know, I would say the world overall. Um, and we work on everything from uh, AI technologies and uh, competition with China, um, uh, a lot on the current conflict uh, with, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and then um, also some issues that people don't always necessarily think about first. I and mean, when I see these agencies, we have a whole program dedicated to military veterans and military veterans and society. So it looking at people, the recruiting life in the military, and then afterwards. Um, and so uh, and so uh, it's a really fun, creative place. And as a as a communications guy, I get to do really creative stuff um, to, to promote our work. That's great I, I, when you can be creative in your position too. That's yeah. Nice. Uh, oh, yeah. Allowing yourself to like have that opportunity and then seeking out organizations and areas that really kind of allow that to flourish. Uh, and, and I know you've been really good at that in your career, finding things that you enjoy and then, you know, allowing yourself to pursue it. Yeah. The, um, I feel like the last time we did a podcast thing, we did about finding your passion. And yes, I feel did. like I've, I've been really lucky. It's available and, everywhere. YouTube, you know, Apple that, that, Podcasts. Absolutely. Links. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think a lot about, and I have to thank my wife in particular, because she tolerates and not tolerates, she supports <laughs> and really get like gets behind the fact that I have so many interests and I've been able to ram them all into this like rolling ball of, of life. And it's, it's really, it's really cool. Um, awesome. Rolling ball of life. Like a rolling ball. Of life. <laughs> That's such a good but, metaphor. But my love for public service still continues. I love working in government. It was the best professional experience I've ever had in my life. Um, both learning, both getting to be a part of it, and the fact that you all are promoting it and inspiring people about it. Again, without any politics, just the notion of serving your community and your country. Mm -hmm. uh, it's such an important um, value, and uh, I. Just love everything you all put into it. It's great. Thank you so much. I mean, Karen and I were remarking just yesterday how it's really important to just celebrate public service mm -hmm. and public servants by extension, because they're the people working in the background that you never really have a chance to, you know, to see. I yeah. Mean, Karen, the, yeah, the point is to kind of work in the background seamlessly without being noticed, because you don't want the, the public to have to see all the ins and outs of what's, what happens. You just want them to kind of enjoy, you know, it, all the benefits of it. and and i think people don't even always realize that you're going to be there regardless of who's elected that oh, you're yeah. going to work with mm -hmm. in the true civil service types so, right, you right. know not the appointed not yeah. the appointed but like you're going to be there for a long time and true professionals and experts in the in in your various fields and that you're there to you know work and work for the taxpayer that's mm -hmm. a, that's a pretty high honor it's awesome continue to implement and provide the public good yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean there's like a policy issue and people vote on it then people get elected then they pass laws etc and then we're the ones that have the opportunity to really make it uh, come yeah. to fruition yeah. It, yeah and 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 what i would also say it's not like i don't know any public servants that i've worked with that are drones that are just like <laughs> oh someone's in charge now i will do what they say right they're going to infuse their expertise and they're going to engage in debate and they're going to help make it as best as possible for the american people they're not simply just going to go and do without thinking and i think that's another thing the critical thinking element is such a great element of being part of public service absolutely yeah, yeah. i mean th these individuals they they get their degrees in this area i mean they they study for years they get all sorts of certifications and training mm -hmm. and everything to actually make that happen and the experience and yeah yeah inherently governmental there's things that you can do in government that you just can't do in other places oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's kind of rewarding as well well, we have a couple of quick questions sure. for you. Um, all right. So we talked a little bit about your career field, your background and all that stuff. I'm curious, though, like in terms of like government service itself, uh, influence, like how, what, what was the initial influence Ooh. that got you rolling with all of this? Influence in government service? The, the moment in my life that influenced me is different than who influenced me during government service. Mm. So if you want the moment, I will tell you the moment. Okay. okay. The moment is this, it's 1993, I believe it's September. I'm in Jewish day school and they, something's happening and they bring all of the kids into this classroom or as many of us as possible, they stuff us into this classroom and they roll in on the big 
heavy television, you know, those big oh, old CRT yeah. TVs yeah. that they, yeah. I don't, like so dangerous, right? <laughs> Always kind of follow it in a minute. They roll it into the class and uh, they plug it into the antenna or the cable or whatever. And we watched live on television, President Clinton with Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat, wow. the signing of the Oslo Accords. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the lore around that would go on to show this moment where these two sworn enemies, right? And, and again, I'm Jewish. So the, the idea that there would even, and look, things are not amazing now, but like the idea that there was going to be peace in our lifetime and hope, it wasn't something that even registered for a 13 year old kid. It was just like constant state of war was sort of the, the you know, um, was the de facto life. Like that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. And there's this moment where Bill Clinton where these two sworn enemies are standing across from each other and they go to shake hands and them shaking hands very controversial at the time. And the lore is that they were hesitating for a minute and Bill Clinton taps them on the shoulders. He kind of ushers them forward to shake hands and make this incredible statement that no one thought could happen. And for me, regardless of the long-term outcome and, and whether or not that conflict is ever resolved, as a kid, that was the moment where I said, whoa, if the United States can do that, if the United States can be a part of facilitating that, that nudge that can not only bring sworn enemies together, mm -hmm. but, you know, one of those in particular at that time, you know, United States biggest ally in the Middle East. And so there's uh, an American national security component. But then there's also for me, this personal component of, of having a connection to Israel that, you know, that there can be um, justice and peace and, and that the United States is putting its credibility out there for that. For me, I was like, whoa, I want to be a part of that. And so without even knowing what diplomacy was, I was, I was reading the, the world section of the Montreal Gazette. I was in Canada, by the way, when this happened. Oh, wow. uh, I was reading, I was an American citizen, but I was reading, but I, it was like, if the United States can do this. So I was reading the world section of the newspaper. I was watching all these movies about history. Um, and lo and behold, over time in college, I, 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 I sort of, came to realize that, oh, if I'm going to be a part of that, diplomacy is really where you have to be a part of that. And that's ultimately when you tie all the pieces together, what led me to doing, a, doing you know, over a decade in the State Department. And um, so that is really the moment that made me want to be a public servant. I almost want to do like the slow clap. Like yeah. <laughs> that is like the most amazing story I've ever oh. heard and about. I, there's, a, there's a really cool epilogue. Oh, here we um, go. You had a chance to go out with drinks with all of them. The well, no, un unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, you know, two out of the three are not are, are not alive, and I never, I never, um, uh, I never got, um, I never got to see Isaac Ravine uh, live in person for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but in the last few years, I don't remember when, but I went to an event where President Clinton was speaking, uh, former president at the time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I waited online and I got a chance to go up and shake his hand and tell him a very short version of this story I told you oh, wow. and thank him for, for that moment and for showing me that, the, um, that of what the United States is capable of when it's at its best. And uh, that was like a pretty surreal like moment that, I, you know, it's about, you know, 25 30 years later. So wow. uh, 25 years. I'm not that old. I'm like, I'm old so it was 60 years. Yeah. Later. Um, and so that was, that was pretty wild epilogue to that, to that story. Um, I'd, I mean, I'd also love for there to be like a, you know, blasting piece in the Middle East, but like, that would be the best epilogue, but right. at least I got to tell the president that. Wow. Well, I, I think one of the bigger things about that is that it's not like there's a finality to certain things. Mm -hmm. It's just this continued progress mm -hmm. and that the dedication true. of public servants to allow that to continue to move forward. That, that's actually like one of the deepest things I've ever heard, because now that I think about it, part of joining public service is this thing is bigger than you. Yep. And it's going to go. And it's actually very humbling because, you know, everyone gets in a moment when their job where they're like, they wouldn't be anything without me. And like. One of the things that public servants really shows you is that like you're extremely valuable, you're giving a lot, but this thing is going to keep flowing without you, mm -hmm. and and that's okay. You, like it you, should be. You're going to leave. Yeah. Maybe yeah. you're going to come back and bring your expertise, um, but you got to invest not just in your career, 
and in serving the people, but also invest in the people around you so that that river exactly. is continuing to flow in the right direction when it's time for you to move on for whatever reason. Right. And it's great because you retire, another generation is there to, to pick up the mantle, continue moving it along. It's like this idea where you, you're carrying the rock as far as you can down the road of progress. Mm -hmm. And when it's your time, you decide to set it down and the next person picks it up and they decide how they were going to carry it differently. Mm -hmm. you know, what is the meaning for them? Their experiences oh, yeah. with that. Yeah, I mean, that goes back to that, that one um, supervisor that I had um, where he was explaining to me, you know, part of what you're supposed to do is you take something, you improve it, you make it better, and you pass it along mm -hmm. and let that next person improve it, make and, it better. And, and, it's and, just... and, and you should really want to do that. Right? Like, yeah. I love hearing some amazing colleagues back at the State Department. And I love hearing the stories from them about all the improvements and like better ideas they have now than when I was running my office. Mm -hmm. I'm always like, oh, awesome. Makes me so happy. Way to go. Do it like do it better. Make it better. Yeah. You know, glad I'm not, you know, there to hold you back anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, on that note, one of the other questions is just about employee morale. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious from all of your experiences that you've had, what would you think is a few good key ingredients to helping with that? Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't say I have like an exact recipe, but I, but there are some ingredients to me that, that when I come into an office, like it, it, it'll, it'll it are going to be part of the, part of the experience. And one thing I really believe in because I work in public affairs where the information environment is moving so quickly, I believe in at a very disciplined rhythm and it can be daily. It can be every other day. It can be Monday through Thursday and take a break for, you know, a meeting less Friday, but, mm -hmm. but whatever it is, short, regular check-ins. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify, you said meeting less. So where you're allowing your meeting less, yeah, right. like a meeting with yes. Friday, like yeah. in my office, it's right? meeting full, yeah. but it is oh, not yeah, meeting, meeting less. Yes, in, 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 in my yeah. in my <laughs> office, actually, in, in my office now. So I originally started a few years ago. In my office, we did meetings every day, and then at a certain point, my team came to me and said, "Look, we get the rhythm thing, but we really need Friday to do some really focused writing. And even though that's only a half hour, twenty five minutes, that meeting or fifteen mm -hmm. minutes, it's breaking the rhythm. Could you give us? And, and you know, and I tried it out, and it's worked great. Yeah. Um, but but so one thing is, especially in my field, so I don't want to speak for every field, but meeting regularly in a way that is predictable and low pressure, but that where there's like an expectation, like we have we have like an agenda that we follow every time that's very boom, boom, boom around the room. And if there's anything extra and if there isn't, we go and move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And I've been using that. I actually learned that technique in Jewish summer camp, which is like to me, like where I learned everything about morale. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Wow. Like everything seems to happen there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Cool. Um, and so uh, so that's that's the, that's the number one, because you develop a language in your office. You you develop space for sometimes there's days where you need to talk a little longer or and, and if people are not communicating that they, they just they don't have a common language and you got to do it, whether it's on Zoom or otherwise. Okay, so that's 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 one thing. Um, another thing that I really love to do, and this again, I'm going to tie back to my Jewish heritage, which is food. And again, I mean, this is not only Jews, of course, but like this is it, it comes from me from my Jewish mother, which is, of course, food. I love like just getting up early sometimes and hitting Randolph pastries on the way to work and bringing food for the office and everyone taking a minute to just enjoy something um, or maybe like egg sandwiches. So food is food is really big. And then I learned this from one of my bosses and one of my greatest partners ever. Her name is Abby Dressel. She is um, uh, serving overseas for the State Department right now. I, she's amazing. But Abby taught me the lesson of when you need to check in with something about something really important, first ask how people are doing. Mm -hmm. Ask, hey, how's everything going? Is that, you know, not like, oh, is there anything wrong? Asking but, it like a, a sincere like, way, rather you, than, hey, how's yeah, it like, going? It's this notion of like listening before you talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. Give give people, and, and, the, and the story behind that one is that I was like really wound tight one year we were working together. I was like, my hair was turning gray in person and I was more, I was short tempered and she needed to have a counseling session with me about like, what is the deal? And she 
I don't know if she was going to come in and like start talking to me or if she had already planned this in advance, but she came in, we had this moment and she said, before we talk about work, is everything okay? Or how are you doing? How's your family? How's life? Mm -hmm. And what was happening is that I had just found out my wife was pregnant, but it was very, very early. And she had to take a trip overseas to Southeast Asia. And I was like, just insanely nervous all the time. And like, once she knew that it, she realized that my, my attitude and my morale was not, had nothing to do with work. I was like super happy at work, but I was, there was this thing that was this major burden. And so we just took a minute to talk about that and it let the air about it. And she gave me the space. She didn't like say, all right, give me the ultrasound. I'll take a look at it. Right. She didn't say that. <laughs> And, and so, so when we did that, um, it was a really big lesson for me. And like, you, you got to look for at people as a whole and not just like start giving them feedback on their memo every single time you talk to them. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Meet them where they're, where, where they are. Yeah. And I know in our organization, we have this leader who's, she's amazing. Um, and her thing is always, you know, ask somebody, right. Of course, you know, how are you, how are things going, but are you in a place right now to be provided feedback? Yes, and, that's so great. And, and you know, maybe maybe they're not. Maybe, no, not not right now. Like, okay, you know, come, we'll so circle back to that. But yeah, and it's like everybody is a person. They each have their own struggles. They each have their own issues that they're dealing that's with. It's, they're not just work. It's not like um, severance, right? Which oh, no, yeah. no spoilers, but you know, it's not like severance where you, you have a different kind of the show. part of you. The, yeah, the the show. Show. Sorry, sorry, the show. The not, Apple, not firing. We're not Apple talking TV about the show um, where you. you you are a whole person going into the office. You have other things going on. And sometimes, yeah. And as a, as a boss, I think you start to, you know, key into those changes in your employees where like something is off and they're not talking. And then that's when I know I always, you know, say that sometimes I have to pull things out of my employees. Like, again, is everything okay? What's going on? Please, you, know, you can talk to me. Um, how can I help? Um, type of thing. So, but, but yeah, it's just, it's that communication. It's that relationship building. Right. So I think that's amazing that you're able to, to learn that and go through that. Yeah. I, I, strategies. I, I was given a, a, a book. I got to remember the name of the book. Um, I think I know what it's called, but um, it's called, I think it's called like radical feedback. Mm, yes. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Radical feedback. It's it's got like an orange cover, maybe. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was just given this book, Radical Candor. That's it. Radical Candor, maybe. It's the one that that leader I was telling you about actually oh, gave, gave to us. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so I was just given this book by a trainer that I work with in communications training, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the the basis of it of being able to do it though is the like you got to have the relationships, right? You got to have the trust. You start with you start radical candor with just like being brutally honest with people. Like <laughs> then you're just obnoxious. <laughs> and I and I really like that. I really like that um, mm -hmm. that 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 um that mentality. It's very validating for someone who's an ENFP. Do you guys do the Myers Briggs? Myers Briggs. Absolutely. Now, what can He's we certify? He's a certified. Oh, okay. So yeah. I'm an ENFP, nice. but you're probably not surprised. Not surprised. In fact, I'm pretty close to that as well. Oh, okay. I believe I, it. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I, but that's, my wife is, I don't know what her last three letters, but she's an I for sure. And um, the eyes have it. Yeah. I think you're a J in there as well. INTJ. Oh, yeah. And so just like knowing that difference between us, by the way, was like a life changer. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know what I was saying about the Myers Briggs things, but. I don't know where I was getting with it, but I did have a fun disc story for you. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds like just really understanding where the other person is mm -hmm. and having that relationship and, and building that bond of trust there oh, that's rather it. than just making an assumption about folks. As an ENFP, which relationships is a big part of that personality type or information type, sure. whatever, having relationships be a part of being successful is like very validating yes. <laughs> How about that. Yeah, because there's things that I'm not naturally inclined to that are also part of it and got to, you know, got to flex, got to work those muscles, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think all of those are, are great strategies that would allow us to really establish a good level of trust and a relationship with the people that we're working with. Not just like, you know, here's this cog that I'm trying to manipulate in order to get this job done. But, you know, public servants, employees, I mean, we're all we're all people. Mm -hmm. And I think you build employee engagement 
through establishing those partnerships and those relationships. Yeah, we're which is we're super people important. serving people. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, I mean, we've, we've had the chance to like, you know, talk for a while. I mean, for years in our relationship and everything, which is just amazing. And you always just have so much candor about yeah. how you approach life and how you like live and embody your, your missions and your goals. It's just such a beautiful thing. Uh, I'm curious if you were going to like leave us with, um, a lasting thought or an idea that you think would be very helpful uh, for our public servants and our fellow colleagues out there? Well, so I'm going to tell my disc story as part of it. Awesome. And it. And it really ultimately comes down to being your authentic self and being true to yourself. So I was in disc, the disc assessment, you know what that is? It's a, it, it, it kind of tells you your work style and then how you fit into a team. Mm -hmm. And I was doing one of these trainings which i love my mother certified in running disc as well and um uh i took the i took the test and then they showed all the dots in the group that had taken the test on the screen as a way of showing this is the breakdown of your organization this is a way to see oh this is how some people communicate this is how other people communicate and they give you tips on how to work with people that are of your style of different styles it's genius and at the tippy, 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 top outlying edge of the circle, almost falling out of the circle, <laughs> I was falling out of in the, the I part of the disc, which is the enthusiasm, character, extrovert, there's my dot. Like it's so <laughs> obviously my dot, because I'd seen one on my paper, and I'm the only one there. And in true I fashion, I raised my hand and I said, I'm the crazy dot on the edge. <laughs> well, I didn't say crazy, but I said, you know, that's that's me. You're the outlier. <laughs> And, and the trainer asked a funny question of, so do you ever feel like an outlier? Do you ever feel like an oddball? Um, and my answer, and I think this is my answer in my forties, much more than when I started my career, but my answer was, I relish that. Oh, we have Captain America. Oh, wow. That's, that's amazing. He's taking Fantastic. the podium. This yeah. is great. This is great. Fine. <laughs> and, I, and I said, I relish that. I relish the idea of, you know, it's not something I feel odd at all. I feel amazing about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that is my big, <laughs> that is my biggest piece of advice, which is, you know, find your authentic self and embrace it and be upfront about it with people because that will help you, um, help them be upfront with you and uh and and help i think build a more authentic uh vulnerable and and cohesive workplace yeah. find your authentic self and embrace it yeah yes that's awesome that is so good well said yeah Chad, we really we really appreciate you coming out uh for all of your support over the years oh. of the gov geeks and everything that we've got going on we're so thankful for everything i love so much of what you all are doing it's so inspiring i love the book I mean, I know you promote the book, but I'm going to promote your book <laughs> about writing government resumes. I think that's one of the hardest aspects of getting into government is actually knowing how to get through the process. But that's also what makes like someone successful is you got to learn that process. And you all are such compassionate and intelligent mentors, and we are lucky to have you. And uh, I love that you're part of the Friday Night Movie extended family as yes. well. So yes. thanks for having me. It's an honor. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in the next one. Yeah. Any and last be thoughts? sure to check out um, Friday Night Movie. We'll, we'll provide night. the link and uh, great, great content. And uh, yeah, thank you, Shai, again for for coming here and uh, spending some time with us in the you know place where we kind of started this whole thing. Um, we appreciate your support and friendship. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. For your service. Recording in progress. Everyone heard uh, that? Yes. I, I did. It. I heard that. that <laughs>